All right, thanks. Thanks for having me here. And today I'll be talking about joining dozens of data streams in distributed stream processing systems. And I'm Yin Jun Wu, and I'm the founder of uh, Rising Wave Labs, uh, an, a company working on stream processing system. And uh, before, we are, I've been running as a company for two and a half years. Before running as a company, I was at uh, AWS Redshift. And, uh, and, uh, and prior to that, I was a researcher at IBM Research Armadon. I obtained my PhD on, uh, from National University of Singapore and was a visiting PhD at Academy Mellon University. So essentially, I started my stream processing journey started, uh, uh, since probably actually 10 years ago. And uh, at that time also, well, I actually had some, uh, spent a lot of time working on a project called Stratosphere, right? So how many people know what Stratosphere is? OK, yeah, good. So yeah, you know, then, then the project turned into Apache Flink and then donated to, to, the, uh, to the Apache Foundation, right? So one slide on what Rising Wave is. So yeah, then we were a sponsor of the conference, OK? But well, I mean, Rising Wave is a distributed SQL streaming database. So if you don't really understand what, SQL, uh, what streaming SQL database is, it's, you can think of a, like okay, a streaming uh, a, a database that is optimized for stream processing. So you can think like it's a database that can provide you with the SQL processing capability, but you just use it like a Postgres. And it's more than just a modern alternative to Flink. Essentially, the program model is a little bit different because well, it's Postgres. The user experience is just like Postgres. It's not like OK, it's, more, it's not like OK, Apache Spark or Apache Flink. And we open sourced the project in last year, in April last year, on the Apache license. And we got a lot of attractions. And now we have already deployed systems in dozens of, the, in production, in dozens of companies. And we have the, uh, hundreds of daily downloads. Yeah, that's the open source deployment test of uh, this month. So yeah, then let's talk about stream processing. Streaming data is everywhere, right? So think about, OK, if you want to run an app, uh, IoT applications, if you want to have uh, data logs, if you have, uh, let's say, sensor data, right? All these data are streaming data. And you probably want to use Kafka, Kinesis, Parapanda, Pausa, right, to, to, to store this data, right? Or probably you, don't, uh, you, you, don't, you probably don't really use Kafka. That's fine. But you definitely want to use an uh, ORTB database or operational database, like, right? like MySQL Postgres. Right? And for this kind of databases, they have a functionality called a CDC, Capture Data Change. Right? Um, and you can consider this like a data stream, because well, it essentially captures those data changes into down, uh, and can deliver those data changes into downstreaming systems. And people are super interested in gaining real-time insights from the streaming data. Think about you are working, um, let's say you are building an app like Uber, like uh, like LinkedIn, like uh, Airbnb, right? You really want to know what just ha what has happened just uh, okay, over the over the last one minute, especially in let's say app like Uber or like uh, app like okay the uh, Robinhood, right? You really want to know okay what just happened. 30 second, uh, 30 seconds ago, or one minute ago, or just 10 minutes ago, right? And what we can do, do? Typically, we use stream processing systems. We can use stream processing systems like Rising Wave, like Flink, like CaseGoDB, if you use, uh, if you're a confident user, right? Or you can use systems like Quicks. Is there any Quicks friend here? Right? Yeah, Quicks. Yeah, and by Wax, right? You can use these kind of systems. And the, what does the system uh, will do? Well, these systems will continuously process large, uh, they, they will ingest the data from, uh, from upstream systems like Kafka, like your ORTB databases, and do computations, do compli uh, complicated complica uh, computations, and then optionally deliver the results into downstreaming systems, such as, OK, you can probably deliver data back to the Kafka, or probably deliver data into your data lake or data lake houses, right? And in stream processing systems, streaming drawing is actually one of the, one of the key functionalities it can provide. So why streaming drawing is so important? 
let's think about uh, okay, you are building an ad, uh, ad, ad monitoring application. You really want to join the ad impressions and the ad click streams, right? If you want to do something like okay, server anomaly detection, you really want to join T TCP performance metrics and the device monitoring metrics, right? Or if you want to do risk and true, you will join the user tra transaction data and the user risk reading data, right? All these applications need joins. And in real world, essentially, we probably do not really join two data, two data streams. We will join dozens of data streams. Why? Because well, the computation, uh, computation logic can be quite complicated. And we probably really want to integrate data from different resources, div different sources, and put them together to get, uh, gain richer insights. And also, uh, more realistically, in many companies, different teams own their own database, or even own their own tables, right? And they do not really share data. You really want to join these insights together so that you can get a, get a, get, get a, get a better insights, right? But unfortunately, most of the streaming systems, streaming processing systems nowadays, will cannot spot streaming joins efficiently. So if you run these systems like okay, Flink with uh, or Apache uh, or, or Spark Streaming, Storm, Samza, without any modifications, you will find that where you will suffer a lot. It will just crash if you want to join 10, 10, 10 data streams. Just try it out, and you will find that where it will crash, or you are just stuck, or probably it will be super slow. Why this happens? So. The key, one of the key reasons is that they probably do not really have a pretty good state management mechanism. Think about what is, stream, uh, what is state management. Think about, okay, you want to join two streams, impression streams and click streams. And for these two streams, you really want to maintain the internal states for every single data stream. For example, if I want to join these two streams, I want to we I we have to maintain a hash table for the click stream, and a hash table for the impression stream. Every time a new impression, every time a new data comes into the impression stream, we will check okay whether there's a match in the in the hash table for the click stream. If there's a match, we deliver the output. If there are no match, then uh, we're good, right? So maintaining the so managing the hash table for the, for, the, for the impression stream and the click stream is pretty important. Not because, OK, we need to solve them, right? It's because, OK, when, people uh, when, we, suffer from, uh, when we suffer a workload fluctuation, we need, to, we need to determine how we can manage the state because our states will grow, right? And this is, uh, this is state management. And more importantly, if we cannot manage this statement together uh, uh, pre uh, pretty well if joining two streams, then we will get a much bigger problem when joining multiple data streams. Why? Because well, when we join multiple data streams, essentially we are joining, in many cases, we are joining the streams in pairwise, right? We, we join two streams together and get an output, and then join the output with the other stream, right? We do such kind of pairwise joins. So think about it. We, if we cannot do one single join wisely, then the entire, uh, the entire stream pipeline will suffer. Then what's a key problem here in state management? Let's talk about state management first. So I think where state management uh, um, in, min, in most of the case, in all these existing systems, the problem here is that where they all adopt a MapReduce documentation model, and they use so-called the compute storage cou uh, coupled architecture. So what it means, let's say that okay, if we want to maintain a state in one machine, and then we want to shuffle it, uh, or we want, to, we want to scale it into three machines, then what do we do? We will essentially partition this, data, this large state into three pieces, and then shuffle them into different three machines. Uh, into these three machines, and every, in every single machine, we will do the local computation, meaning that okay, the, the 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 computation logic will only uh, the computation will only happen in that local machine. The computation will not fetch data from the remote machine, right? So this is compute storage coupled architecture. So what's wrong with that? So think about the state growth, right? 
And you will find that, okay, in every single machine, the state will also grow, right? And the problem here that will, I mean, the problem here that, okay, there are also some data screws, right? If the state grows bigger, then essentially we cannot control how to manage this, whether, we, whether the state can fit, still fit into that exact machine, right? So if, that's, if the state cannot fit into that machine, then what will happen? The system will crash because we'll either we'll run out of the machine or suffer from the OS, uh, OS stretching, right, which will incur high, high spikes, right, high, high latency. Then what we can do in the cloud era? So in the cloud era, the good thing here is that okay, in the, from the infrastructure level, the computation and the storage are decoupled. Think about nowadays you want to build a new system in the AWS or in GCP or in Azure. What it provides, what this pl cloud platform provides, they provide the compute, they provide the EC2, they provide the storage, they provide S3, right? That's S3, right? And this is cloud native architecture. Essentially, we can fully leverage the cloud uh, uh, native architecture to make, uh, to make a better, to build a better stream processing system. How do we do that? The simple idea is that the big idea here that okay, we can just put a state in the remote storage, for example, S3, and use the local machine to do the computation. And the local machine can always fetch a state from the remote storage so that, okay, I mean, the, state, the accommodation layer and the storage layer can scale independently and infinitely. So let's reconsider how we join these two streams in the cloud native architecture. So if we have two streams and we can just directly put these two st states, the, imp uh, the hash table for the impression stream and the hash table for the click stream into a remote S3 storage. As we all know, S3's, S3 capacity is, can be considered unlimited. So if the state increases when we suffer from the uh, uh, workload burst, right? Essentially, we do not need to do anything because the state will be, will be maintained in S3, right? And S3 will handle everything for you. If we find that we are running off the, uh, out of the compute, store, uh, compute resources, then what do we do? The only thing we need to do is to add more computation resources, right? But definitely, the one thing I, I, I didn't really mention here that, okay, Accessing data in the remote storage can suffer from high latency. Then what we can do? Well, a quick fix is that we can adopt the tier storage architecture, right? And I believe that this kind of tier storage architecture has already been adopted in some other systems like Apache Kafka. And also even in Snowflake and Redshift, they also have similar architectures. But I will skip that part because of the, yeah, because of the talk is kind of short. So let's then compare with well, the, I mean, compare these two, two, two architecture, the compute storage coupled architecture and the compute storage decoupled architecture. So the key difference is that okay, how they, uh, because well, this, uh, for, for both, uh, for all these systems, they need to take care of the state. They do not just need to take care of the state. They also need to take care of the failure recovery and the elasticity. Then what's the difference here? If you compare these two architectures, you will find that one of the key difference here is that way how they maintain the checkpoint. So checkpoint, is typically used for recovering, right? When, we, when the system fails, we need to recover from the, from the latest checkpoint. And from the latest checkpoint, we do, reco we, we do data replay and recover to the most recent state. So if we use the compute storage uh, couple architecture, what we will do? What we will do is that we will periodically checkpoint the local state into the remote storage. And if, if node fails, we just fetch data from the remote storage. I mean, the, uh, we, we fetch the checkpoint from the remote storage and recover the local machine. But in the compute storage uh, decoupled architecture, what we know is that essentially the checkpoint is the state. All the state is a checkpoint. Why? Because we maintain the state in the, in the remote machine. We maintain the state in the object store. 
And the checkpoint is also maintained there, right? Logically, it's also maintained there. So essentially, you can use just use the checkpoint, a multi-version checkpoint. Uh, uh, sorry, a multi-version state as the checkpoint. So what? What? Uh, how this architecture will impact the failure recovery and the elasticity? So let's think about the failure recovery. If we adopt a compute storage coupled architecture. Then failure recovery become okay. If we know it fails, then we need to uh, boot another machine and reload the state from the uh, reload the uh, uh, state from the latest checkpoint and recover. Right, and essentially we can do nothing during the recovery phase because well, the system is still, still still down and we cannot access it. But if we adopt a compute storage decoupled architecture, the thing will be totally different. Because where the state is essentially maintained in the remote storage, it's always available. So the only thing we need to do to recover from the, uh, from the failure is to boot another machine and just ask that machine to load the data from the, load the, data from the uh, actually load the cache from the remote storage. And there's no downtime. Because well, the, uh, and the, only thing, the only thing we need to take care of that was the high latency we are suffer because of the first few accesses. Similarly, if we want to, how do we handle the elastic scaling? So if we use the compute storage coupled architecture, the, uh, the, the elastic scaling will become, OK, we need to split the state into, let's say we want to scale from one machine to three machines. Then the thing will become, OK, we need to split the state from this one machine and partition them into three, sta three states, three pods, and ship them there. And, and, and then recover the computation from those three machines. But if we have the compute storage coupled, decoupled architecture, the thing will be totally different. The only thing we need to do is just to boot three machines and ask these three machines to load the, result, load the cache from the remote storage. And that's how the elastic scaling will be totally different. And with the compute storage decoupled architecture, we will have more transient elastic scaling without any downtime. OK, definitely that's, I mean, state management is just one, one, part, uh, one thing it's just one thing we need to take care of for, for joining multiple streams. But more than multiple state management, we have several other things to take care of. And I just list one thing here because of the time limit. That is join ordering, right? Or join, er join algorithms. As I just mentioned, in most of the systems, in most of the database systems, or essentially database systems and stream processing systems, if we want to join these streams, we usually we join the, uh, the, uh, these streams in pairwise, right? We join two streams together, get the output, and use the output to join another stream. But this kind of um, and and the, essentially the query plan, plan will generate a left deep tree, and the tree in this case the, the depth is four. This is not efficient because well, the, the, the the depth is too high. Then how 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 we can ma uh, how we can optimize this case? Then we need to think about how we can reduce the tree height. The algorithm here that, okay, a cl very classical algorithm here that, okay, we can essentially use the boost, uh, bushy tree to reduce the, uh, to reduce the tree depth. And in this way, we can essentially shorten the latency from the tree top end to, uh, to the, to the, to the, uh, from the root to the, to the, uh, to, to the leaf node. Okay. And, uh, and uh, yeah, then to summarize this talk, okay, joining dozens of data streams is quite common, right? And existing streams, uh, stream processing systems typically fail to handle stream processing, uh, streaming joins well if you do not really optimize it. And the decoupling the computer storage architecture can definitely help a lot, especially in terms of the state, because of the new uh, the state management mechanism. And we can further improve the stream, uh, stream join by leveraging better stream join algorithms. Yeah, that's all my talk. And if you want, want to, in, uh, if you are interested in checking our code, well, you can invest our GitHub or directly talk to us in, via Slack. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um,
Do we have any questions in the audience? Yes, I see one right there. Uh, hi, my name is Dennis. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the format of uh, state. Uh, what I uh, is the format that you store in the cloud storage? Is it some kind of like open table format, like uh, iceberg table, uh, Fuji Delta Lake, or is it your own format? Uh, we use our own format because well, you cannot use uh, Hudi as by uh, uh, iceberg here because well, I mean it's kind of slow. One thing is kind of slow, and because well, this kind of uh, this kind of late format is typically optimized for writes. But well, if you want to use uh, use it for the state management, then it will be pretty difficult because well, for state management you do not just have writes; you also need to have a lot of reads and random reads. Right? Think about the hash drawings. You need to look up the hash table. You need to check. Okay, whether it's a match in the hash table, right? So it's just a point access. So we do not really use uh, Hudi, Iceberg, these kind of things. And uh, essentially, we have our own, I mean, a uh, 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 data format called uh, Hamark. And it's kind of similar to RuxDB because RuxDB is optimized for the point access, right? And that's what we, uh, what we have done, yeah. All right, I think we have time for one more question, if there are any. They're not online, so now's your time. No? All right. Well, there's still time to uh, talk to the team afterwards. Um, thank you very much. I'm glad you all joined. All right, all right, thank you.